As we're in the post-Easter season, I'm reminded of this story about a preacher who was standing at the door shaking hands as the congregation departed on Easter Sunday. He grabbed one infrequent member by the hand and pulled him aside and said to him, you need to join the army of the Lord. The man replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, preacher. Then the preacher questioned him, then how come I don't see you except for Easter and Christmas? And he whispered back to the preacher, I'm in the secret service. Far from being secret, we celebrate a message that all need to hear. We give testimony to the resurrection of our Lord, and we need to shout that message from the rooftops. We of the California Pacific Annual Conference pray that this alternative worship gives some relief to our hardworking clergy and laity, that they may enjoy a day off, rest and recuperate from the many challenges we have experienced and will continue to experience. May you enjoy today's worship service. Thank you all. Hello friends, I'm Reverend John Farley, Assistant to the Bishop for Leadership. Last Sunday it was Easter, a day on which the only fitting call to worship was the announcement of the event itself, the resurrection, the greatest act of life saving imaginable. This week we come in the celebration of that and we join together in the call to worship as it appears on your screen. Join with me. On this day and in days to come, may we remember that there are times when God restates the joyful resurrection proclamation. Abilities faded and forgotten are channeled toward new creativity. That's resurrection. Friendships, once killed by a frosty misunderstanding, bloom again into warm reconciliation. That's resurrection. And hopes, glimmering and gone, are rekindled by expressions of caring. That's resurrection. And faith, dulled by lack of exercise, dances again into God's everyday rhythms. That's resurrection. We worship the God whose resurrecting power lives on as does the Christ we serve. So let us worship together, wherever you are.
Salmo 118, versículos 14 al 29 de la edición Dios habla hoy. Yo canto al Señor que me da fuerzas. Él es mi Salvador. En las casas de los hombres fieles hay alegres cantos victoriosos. El poder del Señor alcanzó la victoria. El poder del Señor es extraordinario. El poder del Señor alcanzó la victoria. No moriré, sino que he de vivir para contar lo que el Señor ha hecho. El Señor me ha castigado con dureza, pero no me ha dejado morir. Abran las puertas del templo, que quiero entrar a dar gracias al Señor. Esta es la puerta del Señor, y por ella entrarán los que le son fieles. Te doy gracias, Señor, porque me has respondido y porque eres mi Salvador. La piedra que los constructores despreciaron se ha convertido en la piedra principal. Esto lo ha hecho el Señor y estamos maravillados. Este es el día en que el Señor ha actuado. Estemos hoy contentos y felices. Por favor, Señor, sálvanos. Por favor, Señor, haz que nos vaya bien. Bendito el que viene en el nombre del Señor. Bendecimos a ustedes desde el templo del Señor. El Señor es Dios. Él nos alumbra. Comiencen la fiesta y lleven ramas hasta los cuernos del altar. Te doy gracias y te alabo tu grandeza, porque tú eres mi Dios. Den gracias al Señor porque Él es bueno, porque su amor es eterno. Esta es palabra del Señor. This is the word of God. Would you please join us in our affirmation of faith expressed through the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Hello, my name is Kimmy Stradling and I'm the program coordinator down at Cedar Glen and part of our Young People Ministry of the CalPAC Conference. Will you please join us in the prayer of confession? Our God, we confess our lack of faith. Although we have called you the God of hope, we often feel lost. Different kinds of crosses in many different places that we wonder if there can even be enough resurrection. We are reluctant to leave the tomb of our own ignorance and here to claim the promise. We confess that our weaknesses and insensitivities stand in the way of new life in our world. We know that the world is full of suffering. Our brothers and sisters are nailed to the cross of war, pandemic, poverty, and injustice. People close enough to touch are sealed in the tomb of loneliness and despair, but we have failed to halt the crucifixion to roll away the stone. Will you please jo join me in a moment of silence as we say our personal prayer of confession to, that are in our hearts to our loving God. Our confession is an acknowledgement of our humanness, our need for God's grace. God has promised that we can be forgiven from our weaknesses, our insensitivities, our cynicism, and our lack of faith. We accept that the insurance with the humanity and with the hope that it will lead us towards the resurrection. Now, let us join our voices in the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this second Sunday of Easter, we turn our ears and lives towards the living word, listening to the gospel lesson from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, 
he showed them his hands and his side. <laughs> then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. May God grant us ears to hear the good news and lives that respond with an Easter faith. Amen. Greetings. Uh, it's so, uh, I'm so very blessed to be able to join you all virtually uh, today. Uh, my name is the Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. I am a provisional elder in this conference. I am a um, assistant, a soon-to-be associate professor at the University of San Diego, teaching the theology department, uh, theology and religious studies, and most of my research and writing focuses on issues of um, theological ethics, environmental ethics, and issues of race and ecology. Um, I'm also very excited that beginning in uh, July, I will be appointed as an assistant pastor at Westwood United Methodist Church, um, specifically uh, working with uh, members of the Loft community. So I'm really excited about that. And um, Excited again, as I said, to be joining you all in digital worship today. Now, the title of today's homily um, follows the theme of the general worship today, believing is seeing. Now, when I first read this scripture passage for today's sermon, the one thing that immediately popped into my head is just honestly how bad I feel for Thomas, like just legitimately bad, because <laughs> I think this is what he's mostly known for, this moment where he doubts the resurrection of Jesus, this denial. Um, and even though if you look at other gospels, you see Thomas is, is quite radical in his uh, belief and in, in his readiness to defend Jesus, right, even to the death. Um, but we don't remember that. We just remember his, this particular instance, mostly, you know, and, 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 it, and it's interesting to me, too, because, like, you know, Peter denied Jesus, and we don't confine Peter to this one instance of his ministry. And in fact, you want to be fair and look at this text holistically, what we see is that all the disciples who were gathered um, together in this moment and, and heard from Mary they, that Jesus had been risen, they too were skeptical of her message, right? They didn't like immediately have this kind of belief, if you will. At least in this particular instance, what we see is that Thomas became a person who needed to see to believe that for him, only the physical presence of Jesus would push him to believe that he was indeed alive again, that he was resurrected. Interestingly, Thomas's response is pretty consistent with the way we know that, that memory and, and vision and sight actually work. Um, in a fantastic book 
uh, pretty easy to read actually, called Seven and a Half Lessons for the Brain. Um, a neuroscientist, I would say probably one of the most well-known neuroscientists in North America, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, describes a little bit about how the brain works with respect to vision. Lesson number four in this book is that your brain predicts almost everything that you do. Like literally your brain predicts what you're gonna do. And she gives the example in this chapter of a soldier um, fighting in South Africa during apartheid. And uh, this is a, a white soldier who's really drafted against his will. Like he believes in the resistance movement. He's anti-apartheid. Um, and But he has to obviously go fight for the government. Um, he is on a particular mission, he's in the woods, you know, he's carrying his weapon, um, he's in the, you know, the jungle, it's the middle of the night, and he hears something in front of him, um, and he looks up and he sees a, a guerrilla soldier, resistance fighter, with a, a weapon um, that is aiming at him. And so he gathers his weapon and he gets ready to fire, and fortunately one of his comrades, one of his compatriots, actually pushes the gun down and says, it's okay, that's just a boy, that's a shepherd. And some of you may be curious, well, how did this man mistake a boy that's a shepherd carrying a shepherd's crook, right? For a resistance fighter with a gun aiming at him, what was going on in his brain? What was going on with his vision that he would actually mistake this thing? Um, and actually what we find out with neuroscience tells us is that really nothing actually was wrong with his brain. Um, you see, because we used to think that our brain's visual system operated like a camera. Like we look out into the world and we process what we see, we make sense of it, and that's essentially what we believe what we see. However, we know that's actually not how vision works. It's not how our brain interprets what we see. What we see is actually filtered and constructed through the lens of our past experiences and the past information we have been given about what we we're looking at, right? So our vision is fixed and filtered through our memories and through our assumptions about what it is we're looking at. This helps us to understand what was going on in the soldier's mind. Based on what he knew about the war, the fact that he was deep in the woods with a rifle and that he heard a noise in front of him, all of this cued his vision so that he would see a resistance fighter because everything was telling him that's the most likely scenario of what was in front of him. It was only when his partner touched him and he was able to be grounded, to reground himself, to breathe, to center himself. Only then was he able to truly see what was in front of him, a shepherd boy. This, I believe, is exactly what happened to the disciples, that their seeing was shaped by what they believed to be true. Their seeing was shaped by what they believed to be true. This, I think, is the foundational question that confronts us in this text, that confronts us every day as people of faith. What are the implicit and explicit messages that give shape that inform what we see, that will inform what we see when we look at others, when we look at non-human nature, right? When we look at those whom we love and those whom we have a strong dislike for. What are the messages that give shape to what we see when we look at them? This question really animates my talk today. I think it's helpful uh, to state that I'm really going to be focusing on a couple of uh, specific part verses 19 through 23, and, and they read as follows. It was still the first day of the week, that evening, when the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Now, there's a lot in this last couple of uh, verses that we'll unpack in a moment. But, but I want to begin with 
their encounter, the disciples encounter with the risen Christ. You see, because when they encounter the risen Christ, they are initially stunned. They don't know what they are seeing because at this point, their vision is clouded by their disbelief. They don't believe that Jesus could have been resurrected. They don't believe what Mary has told them. So they are unable to fully see Jesus. But as their encounter with the risen Christ unfolds, right, as they continue to be in the sacred presence, there is a shift in their posture. I imagine at this point, they begin to remember, right, as they are with him, they begin to remember the words that Jesus has spoken to them just even days before his crucifixion. And quite honestly, throughout his ministry multiple times. In chapter 16 of John, we see Jesus' farewell discourse where he promises his followers a life shaped by joy. He promises a life grounded in the gift of his peace and a life guided by the work of his spirit. They remember how they believed what he was telling them. And once they settled into this belief, they were able to see him for who he was. And their belief in Christ begins to shape what they see. And it begins to shape how they see the world. Their belief in Christ begins to reshape how they see themselves. And in this process, they experience the gifts of joy, of peace, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it is the ultimate gift, this gift of the Spirit, that fundamentally changes how they and I would argue, ultimately, how we as disciples of Jesus Christ, how we ought to see the world, right? The power of the Holy Spirit, the belief in Jesus, fundamentally changes how we see the world. The impact of this new way of seeing the world is described in verses 23 through 23. And although these verses have been, honestly, the subject of, of much scrutiny in the life of the church and I could do a whole lecture sermon series <laughs> on the way in which these verses have been used to harm to an extent. Um, these verses were used to justify penance, like the confession of sins to priests and then the doing of actions to purge one of sin. Or they were used to basically say the role of ordained clergy was to grant absolution from sin and not from God. And this is all things that are wrapped up in kind of how we got even to the Reformation. But in truth, a more accurate interpretation of these texts, I would argue, and biblical scholars would argue, must take the entire Johannine corpus into account to really interpret it within the framework of the language and ideas that John was speaking from. First, Jesus' statement on forgiving or not forgiving sin in verse 23 is addressed to the entire faith community, not just to clergy. And so, or I guess in this sense, maybe you might say to the apostles, right? To the 12, right? There are more than a 12 in this particular space. And so any discussion of this verse, therefore, must be grounded in an understanding that forgiveness of sins is the work of the entire community, not just religious leaders. Second, the community's enactment of Jesus's words in verse 23 depend on both Jesus's um, words of sending in verse 21 and the gift of the Holy Spirit in verse 22. In this way, forgiveness of sins must be understood as a spirit-empowered mission to, to continue Jesus' work in the world. And third, in John, sin is not a theological, or I'm sorry, in John, sin is a theological failing. It is not a moral or behavioral transgression, right? It is a fundamental theological misunderstanding. So to have sin is to be blind to the revelation of God in Jesus, it is literally to see Jesus and not see God. So to be blind to the ways in which God has made God so present to us in the life of Jesus. So a more accurate understanding of these verses is that the faith community is able, that, that really the faith community is to, to be a people shaped by Jesus's gift of the spirit and that the mark of that gift will be the power to forgive or to retain sins. 
However, for John, the forgiving of sins does not involve forgiving moral transgressions. And the retaining of sins does not involve retaining moral transgressions. Rather, they involve bearing witness to the identity of God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Right? The forgiving of sins is about bearing witness. And so if we read verses 22 and 23 in light of the entire Johannine corpus, keeping in mind the multitude of ways we are called to love one another because love is from God and everyone who knows love is born from God and knows God, as John states. If we read the text and keep the love hermeneutic of John in mind, a picture of the mission of the church begins to emerge. A vision begins to take shape, a vision grounded in the belief that all of God's children are to be loved. A vision of what the church, of what the world should look like, grounded in the belief that all are to be loved. That all, all are to be loved, including you, including the person that you don't like, the person who has a different political opinion, the person of a different sexual orientation, a person from another country. All, all are to be loved. The mission of the church then is not to be an arbiter of right or wrong, but to bear an unceasing witness to the love of God in Jesus. It is in choosing or rejecting this relationship with God that sins are to be forgiven or retained. You see, believing in the love of Jesus, it, it fundamentally changes what we see. It fundamentally changes what we see, and we know this not only from a spiritual aspect, but literally from a scientific aspect. It changes how we see the world when we believe in the love of Jesus and allow that love to shape us. Believing in the power of love of Christ shapes our memories such that we remember that all human beings are created in the image of God. Believing in the love of Jesus shapes our memory such that we remember that all human beings are animated by the power of the Holy Spirit. It shapes us in such a way that we remember that God spoke over all of creation and called it good. And all of this reflects God's love for us, and it reflects God's desire to pull us towards lives lived through the context of love. By loving one another as Jesus loves, we reveal God to the world. By revealing God to the world, we make it possible for the world to choose to enter into a relationship with the God of limitless love. By loving one another, we give people the opportunity to believe in the power of love and to reshape what they, in fact, see in themselves and in others. Believing in the resurrected Christ, believing in the greatest gift that is love that God has given us, believing in these things changes what we see. It, it, it changes us. It allows our spirits to settle into a posture of love so that when we look into the world, we see a world in need of love and we see ourselves having the capacity to both give love and receive love. Believing informs our seeing. Believing is seeing. And when you see someone worthy of love, that is in fact love, it changes. It fundamentally shifts the way you engage them. You see them as a human being and you acknowledge that humanity and in loving them, you make sure that you do not dehumanize them, do not dismiss the fundamental assumptions of their personality. In loving them, you ensure you are striving to your best extent to make sure that they feel loved, that they feel heard and valued, and they are able to be themselves, that they are allowed to hear, as Thurman would say, as Howard Thurman would say, the sound of the genuine in themselves, so that they may hear the sound of the genuine in you. And so may our belief in the strength of God 
the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit inform our seeing such that we see the suffering of the world as God sees it. That we see the suffering of the world as God's own suffering as described in Matthew 25, so that we may have the courage to do something about it, to do something about it. And that whatever it is we do is grounded in love so that in believing in love, we can see the potential, the promise, the possibilities of the beloved community. Amen.
Hear these words of benediction. As we close our worship today, may you go forth and both see and believe. We give testimony to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who brings us life and life abundant. Proclaim this message to all whom you encounter. Amen.